Hello. My guest today has spent more than 40 years in the frame, either being painted or drawn or sculpted as a life class model. It's June Fairlong, who needs no introduction to most people in Liverpool. Hello, June. Welcome. Um, Hello. What interests me is that you took that rather unusual profession. Uh, your family were well connected in Liverpool. Your uh, father ran the Cotton Exchange. Your cousin, Trevor Furlong, for many years ran the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board. Uh, and yet you went off in this, uh, uh, was it regarded as bohemian, what you were doing? Well, the thing is, in, in my day, there were no grants, you see. We, I, was, I was brilliant at art at school. And when I left school, uh, my parents said, we're not going to keep you at art school. I thought, well, what can I do? I thought, oh, tomorrow, they'll forget that. And uh, I, I went to um, school in uh, Prince's uh, Avenue, St Margaret's, and then off to St Edmund's in Devonshire Road, you know, and games captain, fit and all that, champion skater. And uh, anyway, one day we're all sitting around my house, where well, I was born in my house at 85 years ago. And my mother re reached across the table, she said, all right, June, you're so good at art, go and earn a living at it. And I got up, I left my meal, I sat on the chair in the corner. I thought, they mean it, they're not going to pay the fees, what am I going to do? I was 17, I was in advertising in North John Street, in Leon Nightingale, loved the job, oh, I loved the job. And then I knew some of the local artists, because you could count them on two hands in those days. I mean, there were, this was before the polytechnic system, before the John Moores University, before the grants, you know, and all that. And they all used to come and see me in the coffee break, Don McKinley, you know, all those people. And uh, oh, I, li I, liked, I liked the job, but the money was poor. And but I, over, over the next 40 years, you were, you were the subject uh, for 55,000, as you famously say, 55,000 pairs of eyes. At least. Uh, both in Liverpool and working in London. Um, and yeah. of course, you've become famous for having had as one of your uh, artists, John Lennon. Oh, now, yeah. Now, obviously, you got to know him quite well. And Stuart Sutcliffe, who was yes. also a, f a founding member of the Beatles, he, yes. he was a better artist than John, wasn't he, in a way? Well, yes. Uh, yes. Because John didn't like the history of art, did he? No. So he was just interested in actually applying it sort of thing in that sense. But you got to know him quite well. When I, well, when I'd got, uh, you know, first I started off at the art colleges, uh, at the Liverpool College of Art, night class, night classes. And I, I kept the day job, as it were. And then uh, I, came, I was full time at the art college. And then I think in the early 50s, I, I took off to, for London to the Slade, the Royal College, the Academy. I, I think went to London with £5.50 and a job at the Slade. Spent a fortune in the south of France. I was making money then. I, I liked the advertising agency. It was beautiful, but I was acquiring very expensive taste, you know. And <laughs> the money didn't, uh, it wasn't good enough, so... That's it was when you came what back, I did. When you came back from London, of course, which we'll talk about later, when you, when you came back from London that you met John Lennon. Yes. And, well, uh, and you told me a lovely story once, which is probably in no Beatles book, that he came round to your house and borrowed some costumery because he was playing uh, Dame in pantomime. Oh, yeah. All that stuff. All that, My grandmother's big lace of pink uh, corsets and hats and earrings and everything. Well, I got on very well with John Lennon. I mean, he, he was a, a Liverpudlian, you know, a real Liverpudlian. Hard man. I mean, he took to fame like a duck takes to water. But, I mean, he would have never made the fantastic success that he, he did as a Beatle. Uh, as an artist, you know, but I mean, he just happened to be at the art college and I remember sitting there like I'm sitting here now and he burst into the room and then he looked at me and then he went out and he put his jacket on and he came in and he said, my name's John Lennon, he said, I've, I've, I've uh, signed up to, to, to do a course here and I'll, I'll be drawing you, is that all right? So uh, nobody had ever said that to me before. I said, yeah, yeah, get an easel and get a chair, sit down. And then uh, I, he was okay. I mean, perfectly all right. I never had a crossword with John Lennon, you know. It was me who told him to uh, 
sign up with Epstein. I got to know him very well, you see, and he'd tell you everything, but people do that, you see. And uh, he said to me, this fellow, he, he, he wants to uh, manage us. He, he, he ran NEMS in uh, Whitechapel. And, and, and I, I said to John Lennon, well, what have you got to lose? And he said, not a lot. He cracked up laughing. He said, not a lot. And uh, the next day he came in, and as soon as I came in, he said, I've been down there, I've signed that contract. You know. and I said, OK. So, I mean... Um, but Stuart Sutcliffe was a he, friend he of his. He was a better artist, wasn't he? If he hadn't died so tragically, could he have made it as an artist? Well, I, I mean, he, he didn't. He, he didn't take his art seriously. He was uh, into the music. I mean, uh, but he was asked to leave the art college because he, he didn't do the art history. This is John Lennon. Though. This is John Lennon. I mean, if you were Rembrandt and you, you didn't do the art history, you were out. It was part of the course, and um, so you, after about a year. He, he, he left, and then, um, of course, he met uh, Epstein, and, and, and he used to have that shop in Whitechapel, didn't he? I, he? I used to have all the LPs outside. I used to buy those LPs for about a pound. He ran that shop. And then, of course, he saw John Lennon he used to pay uh, lunchtime at the Cavern. And um, Stuart Sutcliffe was a very good artist, Stuart Sutcliffe. He used to follow me around everywhere, Stuart Sutcliffe. All the drawings of me uh, belonged to Pauline Sutcliffe, his, his uh, sister. And they're all, uh, he had a wonderful show at the Royal Academy. And uh, those drawings, you see, they don't belong to me. Yeah, I think you, maybe- You haven't got in your, in your attic somewhere uh, anything that John Lennon drew of you or anything? No, uh, millions of notes he used to put through the door, inviting me to parties. Well, I never went to those parties because I worked all the time. I was 9.30 in, in the morning in the art college and uh, those classes went on and then the night class, I'd be coming back about quarter past nine at night or I'd be out at the training colleges, you know, over Liverpool. It was full time or down at the Blue Coat. I mean, these were the days when you had to draw academic days. Well, you know, I know you've got a, a thing about this that today they don't concentrate as much as they should maybe in fine arts on, on drawing. You had to, rather like Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, you had to be able to be a draftsman, didn't you? You had to be able to draw. It yeah. wasn't just daubs or it wasn't just abstract. Well, I mean, like, art education has changed completely. It's not for me to say it's better or worse or anything, but it's changed. The life drawing does go on to a certain extent, but it's not um, the number one important as it used to be only, in my days. You weren't the only life drawing subject, oh, were you? There were quite oh, a we few. we had four full-time, uh, four of us, four of us at the art college, a male model, and uh, the other models as well as myself, yeah, four of us. One thing you'd have to be uh, gifted with uh, doing your job is patience, isn't it? Because well, the thing is, if you, if you weren't interested in art, it would be the most boring job in the world. But of course I was, you know. And then when I went off to London, oh boy, I met Lucian Freud, Francis Bacon, all the really big stars, a handful of really big stars. But I mean, when I knew Lucian, Lucian Freud was uh, pushed to put his hands on 40 pounds. He, he left. 40 million, <laughs> Lucian Freud, when he died. And he, 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 like John Lennon, they always wanted to know things. I think, oh, blimey, here's Lucian. What does he want? June, what about this? What about that? Oh, what about that? He hated anything, Lucian Freud, that was not perfecto in public. He hated badly dressed people. He hated drunks. He hated druggies. And he was always looked pretty good. And I, I, he liked me because he... he, he saw that I could handle myself whatever the situation or what drinks were there or what parties but we'd go he'd say come on June I know better parties than this he, he, I suppose Lucian Freud was what he'd call a sort of inverted snob his name was Freud wasn't it Lucian Freud and uh, if he thought he was invited because of who he was he'd leave right away but I got on extremely well with him and all the people all those big stars Frank Arbor Francis Bacon I met used to treat me like the Queen Mother, Francis Bacon, when he saw me in Soho in those uh, coffee bars and things. But, I mean, I've got Lucian to thank for the fact that I know all, knew all about the uh, West End of London and all that. And uh, I remember once him saying to me, I'm going to marry into the society next time, June. I said, are oh, you, Lucian? 
Yeah, he said, he said, that's what he said. He said, they drink the best wine and they buy the best pictures. He ended up a millionaire. The wife ended up an alcoholic. Were all these people, fantastic characters in, in those London schools, you know. Well, what was interesting, and we'll come back to them in the second half, Lucian Freud, of course, was the grandson of Sigmund Freud. Yes. Uh, having, we all know about Freudian moments, that's his grandfather. And Francis Bacon ended up probably, along with David Hockney, as the most famous British artist of the 20th century. Yes, but Francis Bacon didn't like Hockney. He thought he, and I think, I never met Hockney. I regret very much never having met David Hockney. I was back by special request at the art college when Hockney had arrived at the Royal College, you see. They had no money at all, Hockney, no money at all. But um, he made the money in, in London. But he was a superb draftsman, you know, David Hockney. And, and um, Francis Bacon, I read, only read recently that he thought, didn't like uh, Hockney as an artist. And also Francis Bacon preferred Lucian Freud's early, early work, well, which I thought was like something you'd do in a sixth form, uh, Lucian's early work. Well, it's all extremely fascinating, and once you start, you've got all these anecdotes. We'll have some more of those uh, in the second half of the programme, so you don't go away. Welcome back. My guest today, June Furlong, uh, in 2008, she was named as one of the 800 people who had put Liverpool on the map. This is when we were assessing ourselves for capital of culture. But when it comes to fine art, I would say June's in the top 10, quite Thank frankly. You very much. Uh, first of all, as a life class model for many years, and uh, nowadays organising exhibitions. Now, you mentioned in the first half, we talked about John Lennon, uh, you mentioned in passing Sigmund Freud. Uh, grandson, Lucian Freud, the artist, mm -hmm. who was at the Slade School, and you also knew Francis Bacon. I mean, two tremendously important figures. Um, you have fond memories of both. Oh, yeah. But uh, I didn't see Francis Bacon as much as I saw Lucian. Lucian used to teach at the Slade every Friday, come in every Friday, and he used to say to me, this is my day of rest here. I paint so slowly. I've got to be in my studio all day to get anything done. But um, he knew what all the students have done. If anybody approached him and asked him for a criticism, oh boy, they got more than they bargained for. He knew who was who and who, what was what. You know, he used to talk a lot to Ewan Uglow, who was a very good artist, Ewan Uglow. He went on to win John Moore's painting. He did, he won a John Moore's prize yeah. with that big standing figure, you know. And he came into the art college, Liverpool Art College, and he was smiling from, uh, oh, and, and um, he invited me down to the walker for that night. Well, he came to me because um, in, I, I lived in Hampstead in London, which was expensive. And uh, I lived with another model called Iris Martin who came from... Um, Lake District, because uh, the rents were very high. And she was standing for him, you and you go. And all, she wasn't as used to standing as I was, and all her legs were swollen up. And I'd have to go out and get her surgical spirit and all that. So I go in, where's this fellow, you and you go? Who is he? And then I, I, I saw him. In, in, in the Slade, they had the men's life room, only men drawing. Then they had the ladies' life room, ladies drawing. Then they had a communal with ladies. I, I'm just there. So, but when I looked at the painting, he was down to about here with this painting of Iris, which was brilliant, you know. And uh, I uh, went in to say about uh, Iris, you, you know, you, you, she, she, she can't stand like that too much. And then I, uh, I went, I walked away. And then he called me back. He said to me, uh, do you do any private modeling? So I said to him, well, if the price is right, oh, that's no problem, he said. So he said, a friend of mine in Barons Court in London has got a studio, and uh, could you come along this Sunday? I, I said, OK, and, uh, all right, yes, I could. Was, I needed, Amstead was very expensive. I to, you, you have to work a, a lot to pay those rents and everything. And when I got there, who was in the front row drawing you and you glow? And it was only supposed to be uh, two sessions. It went on for months, and I used to go every uh, Sunday. And um, that... Um, um, painted, the way you and you glow painted was like a mathematical 
formula, did slay you technique. Rank the results I, of what? Did you always approve of the results of what people did? I well, mean, I, it's not for me. I'm not an art critic. I'd look around. I could see who was who and who was what. I mean, you've got all the provincial uh, star turns of the provincial schools applying to get into London schools and the, the, the places there's only a few. I mean the staff at the Royal College often used to say to me, there goes so and so, we let her go by, you know, we didn't take her on well, and she became very good. The talent of tomorrow yeah. is part of the game. And then game, other people they take do nothing. So after a year they'd have a weeding out at the Royal College. They, they take those interviews very seriously but you never know once um, I mean, I've, I saw it at Liverpool College of Art. You've got the star turn of the sixth form. He comes in, he looks round. What's the competition here? Nothing, nothing. So he spends all the day in the crack or learning to play guitar. Others come and think, oh, I was very good. And I thought it was all right until I came here. And they work like mad. And of course, leave all the others standing. Well, was, apart, apart from looking back over, as I say, four decades, you're still... Uh, in your mid 80s, very much active in organising. You've got to know all the artists over well, the yeah, years. But not in organising, so in organising exhibitions. Not so much now, Joe. I don't do. For me to get a, an exhibition and sometimes a hundred artists in, it's three days standing up. And sometimes I'd be at the Royal Liverpool Hospital at ten o'clock at night after I'd finished at the uh, night class at the um, at the art college. I go along there and. Uh, get everything ready for next day for the joiners and then go back home and then uh, another day. And uh, I was always in the foundation studies, wonderful art foundation studies at John Moore's. And Pete Mosdale was in charge of say, June, no exhibitions. I'm bringing my group up tomorrow. So I'd have to be there at half an hour and then think, well, I'll just go along to the Royal Liverpool Hospital now. See, they've got the, the pictures up and lost the sequence, the joiners. I had a whole lot had to come down. I've had all that. So, um, you've, you've and, particularly and got the to universities know, and everywhere I put Over them the up. years, you've got to know a lot of the artists, and yes. two particularly, we've got examples of uh, one, a painting by George Jardine, which he did yes. for you, a Wirral artist, and one by Josh Kirby, who was living in Crosby. And Josh, of course, did all the illustrations for Terry Pratchett. That's right. Um, but there are, there are many artists who you've um, helped along and who've been very indebted to you, and particularly George, maybe. Oh, George Jardine was a lifetime personal friend of mine, 47 years. He lived in uh, Wallasey, and uh, if he'd have been more ambitious, but George hated going down to London, you know what I mean? All that pussyfooting down in those Mayfair galleries. <laughs> I'd be saying, you know, they want to buy pictures. Well, Mr Jardine, how much would you do you want, you know, for that picture? And uh, I'd be looking there. Well, he'd come out. Well, I teach at Liverpool College of Art, you know, and I don't live on sale or work alone and this and that. And the other and uh, but um, I George was a very good friend of mine I do miss George Jardine it, not easy to replace we 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 were all over Europe all a whole of Europe several times George with, and myself he's a with, very good friend one in a million great perspective you've got are you hopeful and optimistic about the future of art do you like yeah. some of the trends and not some of the others well, I, I mean, I, I don't go to all these exhibitions like I used to do, but I know what's what in London. I know um, I've been down to the David Hockney um, Museum in, in uh, Yorkshire a few times. Wonderful, wonderful museum. And uh, I'd always really like to uh, met uh, Hockney, but as I say, he arrived at the Royal College when I was back in Liverpool, you see, and I never met him. And uh, a superb draftsman. There are a few of them around, you know. I mean, uh, I don't mind Tracy Hemming. A lot of people run Tracy Hemming down. Well, <laughs> I, I think Tracy Hemming has got something. I saw her on a television program judging some students' work, and she took it very seriously, you know. And that little bird she had on the cathedral, I thought it was marvellous. City got, culture. It's a, it's a little brass. She's yes. brass bird in the uh, next to the cathedral. That's right. And she's also got the scripted message in lurid pink at the back of the cathedral. Yes. I mean, a lot of people would say, particularly the second item, is not really art, really. Well, and we've got it's such a personal thing. There's, the thing is, there's no right or wrong in art. If you do a mathematical pro 
problem. You, you, you've got it right or you've got it wrong. I mean, there's so many variations on the theme and as long as you can bring off your original idea without getting waylaid in the middle of it. And a lot of people can't, you know, they make good starts, but they can't follow them through. The thing, and, about, the thing about art these days is that a lot of people acquire things over the years uh, that go up in value. George Jardine's paintings, for instance, have gone up in value. Uh, I, over the years, I have to say, I have bought some stuff in Liverpool galleries that has mm. increased in value. But you buy these things ostensibly because you like them, not because you're oh, thinking yes. of your future bank Definitely. balance. Definitely. Definitely. You must only buy something because you like it, not because you think you've made an investment. That's a bad idea to buy art, buy, buy an antique better, you know what I mean? But especially with contemporary art, you must buy it only because you like it. And people who bought George Jardine's paintings say to me, I'm never bored with George's painting because there's always something to look into, you know. Well, he was a surrealist, wasn't he? And yeah, in the foreground, well, you'd see all these little figures. Difficult to classify figures. George. You couldn't really put him in a category. I mean, you've got to see George's paintings. It, it, well, it wasn't pure surrealism. Dali was a surrealist. Um, um, George was different, it was fantasy. And he was an intellectual, of, it was George, you know. I had a picture he'd done of Lake Gwynant in Wales, and in the foreground, you mm. see a, the mountains in the background and the lake, which anyone can see, were all these little figures in the trees. It's yes. intriguing, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, yes, yes, yes. June has got this book, everyone, by the way, uh, a life study, which covers most of the things that we've mentioned today. It's absolutely fascinating, the, the people you've met. Uh, like with all stories of lives, would you like to add to it? Are you happy with it? <laughs> Well, yeah, for sure. The book, Jill Block and myself, uh, she was at Liverpool University, and people say to me, one book on your life? There should be about four. <laughs> it took a long time to, make, to do that book, and then I think it was a limited edition of about a thousand, and they sold out at the art galleries a long time ago, you know. She gave me some and she kept the rest, and uh, it was pretty hard work, uh, you know. I mean, I, I, even though I say it myself, I speak the international languages of the professional art. Well, she was a good writer. Well, things I'd just rattle off, you know, I'd have to... <laughs> well, we've done the book, and the book's there, and, uh, you know, I, I, there are some I think about. Um, I, I don't know, I suppose so. Well, I have to say, you certainly do rattle off the anecdotes. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, talking to you today and I hope there are many more years to come where you will still have an input um, in, in art and to be able to organise exhibitions by future artists. But thank you very much today uh, for giving us your anecdotes. That's June Furlong. Thank Pleasure. you. And Pleasure. I hope to see you again shortly. Pleasure.